That is that I've waited 40 years. I had stopped praying that my mama and my daddy would, would ever reconcile or forgive each other. And I saw it. You know, she's the very last person with my father before he died. She was holding his hand, reading the Bible to my daddy. Y'all, redemption happens. Some of us just have to learn to wait, to stand, to stand in the promises. He is good and He does good. And ultimately, everything will work out for our good and His glory. Calls that happen. I love the story of Anna because if you back up, You read in the middle of of Luke 2 about this teenage couple named Joseph and Mary. And they bring this baby boy named Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, wonderful counselor. According to the book of Moses, they bring him to temple in Jerusalem when he's eight days old. Because that's what the law of Moses said they had to do. It said the first male who opens the womb. In other words, the firstborn son in every family. You bring him to temple. And you present him before the Lord to be consecrated to the Lord. You present him before the Lord as an eight-day-old infant. So you stop and think about Anna. She's 103. And she's in the the girl's bathroom. She's refilling the, the paper towel dispenser. And she hears her best friend Simeon, who's also old as dirt, and he's in the temple She hears him begin to sing because Dr. Luke says Simeon, this man, had also prayed the same thing Anna had prayed. Lord, don't take me home until I see you. I don't care about anything else, Yahweh. Just let me see Jesus. Let me see Jesus. Most theologians think he's in his 80s based on some other documents. So he's an old man. She's an old woman. I don't know if they dated. It would be so cool if they did. (laughs) But when he sees this teenage couple walk in to temple, and Joseph is wearing a backpack from the gap, and there's pigeons squawking in the backpack because they didn't have enough money for doves to sacrifice. They had to get the scratch and dent version of sacrifice because they were poor. And they come walking in the temple and he's got pigeons in his backpack and Mary is carrying an eight-day-old baby boy and the second Simeon sees that baby, he goes, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. He is the Savior of all mankind. He begins to sing a song he's written himself. He's never sung it before. He begins to sing in temple and Anna's in the bathroom and she hears the song and because he's old, his voice is thin and it's wobbly and she thinks, oh, he's broken another hip. (laughs) And she charges into the temple so that she can help her friend and the second she starts running toward him down the aisle, she sees that baby. And Anna, 103 years old, we're told, And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting, waiting for the redemption of Israel. He's here, he's here, he's here. Y'all, holding up a sword and a shield and standing, that's not the posture of passivity. That's actually the posture of power to say he will do it. Lord, I'll walk where you tell me to walk. And until you tell me to move, I'm going to stand here with my front to the rest of the world. And I'm going to say, my God is a great God. The two biggest miracles I've seen with my own eyes that happened in our family were on the other side of waiting. On the other side of waiting a long time. The first you know about, it's my baby girl, Missy. She was actually my third adoption attempt. I can't imagine life without her. She's not my hope. Jesus is my hope. But how kind that he gave me a kid who looks almost exactly like me. You know, most people can't tell she's adopted. Um, The second miracle happened two weeks after I committed to adopt Missy. Two weeks later, my mom had major surgery. And she went in. uh, She had a five-hour surgery. And the surgeons came out and they said, we think we've gotten all the cancer. We believe as a result of this surgery, your mom has a really good shot at at living past this. 
And then three days later, when she was still in the hospital and her health was declining, the surgeons met with my sister and I again, and they said, we actually can't explain why her health is declining. But if something doesn't turn around, her numbers are getting lower and lower and lower. And even though we think we got the cancer, we also think y'all need to prepare for your mama's death. And uh, my sister and I were keeping vigil at her bedside. They had intubated her. She wasn't speaking much. She was mostly out of it. But four days after the surgery, she opened her eyes and she kind of whispered, I need to see your father. My sister looked at me because our dad, our stepfather, Dad Angel, had died a year before. And we thought she was just groggy from the meds, and she thought Daddy was still alive. And so my sister is not as Gabby as I am, and she thinks I'm closer to Mama, so she was like, it's on you. you got to tell her. <laughs> and so I leaned down, and I said, Mama, I, I am so sorry, but um, Daddy died last year. I said, remember, Daddy, Daddy died in the hospital this time last year. And she said, not that, Daddy. <laughs> she said, I want to see your father. I want to see Everett. You know, my mom and my dad divorced when I was five years old, and it was as ugly a divorce as I've ever been witness to. A uh, lot of abuse, um, extreme anger huge animosity. I think they had spoken maybe two sentences in 40 years. My mother and my father uh, pretty much hated each other. And so I, I wasn't even sure how to respond. But I said, okay, mama. And I called dad. This is the daddy who had colon cancer that metastasized to lung cancer. And I said, daddy, you know, we're in the hospital with mama and she's asking for you. And he said, all right, I'll be there in an hour. My daddy comes swaggering down that hospital corridor, and I told you, he's like a mini, a mini John Wayne. He's just little, 5'7", 160 pounds, sucking wet. I got mama's jeans. Um, <laughs> she's actually little too, but anyway. Um, he comes swaggering down the hallway, and he's, he's a quiet man, kind of a taciturn man. And he came up to my sister and I. He had called us when he got there, so we were outside Mama's hospital room. And he said, I love you girls. Your mom and I need some privacy. Y'all stay out here. I'll be back in a minute. And he goes in, and I turned to my sister, and I said, what if he puts a pillow over? Like, I mean, I didn't know, you know. They hadn't seen each other in years and years and years. They, they hated each other, and I thought, oh, crud, you know. We're going to be on Jerry Springer. And... Um, he didn't come out for about 30 minutes, and, and I really was concerned. We didn't know what was happening. He came out about 30 minutes later, and he said, I love you girls. Your mama's going to be okay, and I'll be back here tomorrow. And he just walked away. My sister and I were like, <laughs> and we walk into mom's hospital room, and y'all, she's sitting up in bed. There's color in her cheeks, and this is as close to verbatim as I remember it, what my mother said. She said, your father prayed for me, he anointed me with oil, and I'm going to be fine. And I was just like, <laughs> I mean, I thought they've given her that medicinal pot because I, I mean, I, 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 I just can't even believe this. And y'all, that was April of 2012 um, until my father died. Um, my daddy Harper died <laughs> January, uh, February 13th. 2013, and until my daddy died, every single day, he and my mama talked on the phone, and she saw him. They saw each other two or three times a week. It wasn't romantic. They just, they knew each other at their worst when they were kids, and God redeemed their story, and I, I, I was just amazed by it that year for Christmas. <laughs> I went home to Orlando, and Mama said, I've invited your dad to be here. And we have this big family Christmas where all my aunts, my first cousins, and my uncle come in. And we were at my Aunt Darlene's house that year. And I thought, you know, Mama has kind of romanticized this. And, and she and Daddy are, are friends now. But I thought, our family is not going to accept Daddy. Because he was, you know, he was mean and really abusive when I was younger. And, you know, they're protecting their sister. And, and so I was nervous. 
And Daddy comes walking in. I'll never forget it, y'all. It was a few weeks before uh, he ended up being bedridden with hospice. He comes walking in. He's still got a little bit of John Wayne swagger. But when he opened the door at my Aunt Darlene's, every single one of my aunts, my uncle, and all of my first cousins ran and greeted him like a heroic soldier returning from the war. I mean, they just, all of them lined up to hug my daddy. And I thought, that that's it. That is it. I've waited 40 years. I had stopped praying that my mama and my daddy would, would ever reconcile or forgive each other. And I saw it. You know, she's the very last person with my father before he died. She was holding his hand, reading the Bible to my daddy. You know, redemption happens. Some of us just have to learn to wait, to stand, to stand in the promises. He is good and he does good. And ultimately, everything will work out for our good and his glory. I want y'all to stand up, holding up your sword. And some of y'all are just going to have to stand a whole lot longer and go, I'm standing for my marriage. I'm standing for my children. I'm standing for the children I have yet to be a mama to. I'm standing for unbelievers in my family. I'm standing for my mean old daddy. I am going to stand because he is good and he does good. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.